day. It's a great day. Thank you, Brian, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you, Brian, for sharing my story. You all didn't realize uh, that Brian was actually telling my story. I was that kid with asthma whose parents missed work to take me back and forth to the hospital over and over and over again. I stand before you not just as the nation's doctor, but as the nation's patient, someone who has seen this play out, unfortunately, to the detriment of me, to my family, but also to the detriment of the community. And uh, I also want to give a special nod to my good friend, Mayor Betsy Price. Uh, she's taken the lead to bring Blue Thumbs to Fort Worth, Texas. And I had the opportunity to visit them in Fort Worth last year and see all the wonderful work they've done to engage businesses and community leaders to invest in health. And that's part of what today is about. It's about hearing best practices, uh, learning about the toolkit that's available for different communities to be able to invest in health. I'm delighted, delighted to join this bipartisan policy center event to release the new report, Good Health is Good Business. And it's critically important. What Brian didn't tell you is uh, I've got an MD, I've got an NPH, but my most important credential is DAD. And I've got a uh, 15, a 13, and a nine-year-old, and I stand before you as the first generation of parents in the last half century who can't look their kids in the eye and say, you're gonna live a longer life than what I'm going to live. We know that for the third year in a row, life expectancy is declining due to deaths of despair, due to alcoholism, due to uh, suicide, due to opioid misuse, which is really accelerating the conversation that we're having right now, due to obesity. And we know we can't address these societal problems alone. We know that the private sector has a large role to play because they have a stake in their communities and they're bearing a large part of the cost of poor health. So thank you to the Bipartisan Policy Center and the De Beaumont Foundation for highlighting this report and providing action steps on how businesses and public health can work together. This report, along with my Community Health and Economic Prosperity Initiative, will make great strides in improving the health of our nation. So I want to back up a little bit. I'm a vice admiral in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, 6,500 full-time public health professionals committed to advancing, promoting the health and safety of our nation. But the most visible role of the Surgeon General is to communicate the science around health to the American people. And in that role, I'm focused on promoting health, preventing disease, and leading with the science to help all Americans live the healthiest lives they can. But I'll tell you, even though I'm committed to leading with the science, I want you all to remember something that I say often to folks, something that I said to the new doctors. It's that time of year when we've got new residents graduating and going off to practice alone, and we've got new interns coming in. That all the science in the world doesn't matter if people don't think you care about it. People need to know that you care before they care what you know. And where my work intersects with all of you all is around the topic of improving the health of communities by making the connection between investments in communities and associated economic prosperity. And I want to tell you a quick story. You know, it's easy for me to talk about the successes I've had. I want to talk about one of my biggest failures when I was head of the Indiana State Department of Health. Uh, we had a, uh, had a conversation about whether or not we should raise our tobacco taxes because we had some of the lowest, still have some of the lowest tobacco taxes in the country. And the science, the science says that when you raise the cost of tobacco, fewer people smoke. Well, we were in front of the legislature and had two hours of testimony from the experts, the choir, telling us quite frankly what we already knew. Tobacco is bad for you, and if it costs more, less people smoke. At the end, we had about 15 minutes of testimony from the business community. And I say business community the mom and pop bars, the gas stations, and the casinos. And they didn't, they didn't refute anything that we said as health experts. But they said, you know, if you do that, people are just gonna go across the border to Ohio and buy their cigarettes, and we're gonna lose jobs. It's gonna be bad for business if we actually lower the, or raise the tobacco taxes in our state. And, uh, you know, I reflect on that often. I, I ask myself, if I had to do that all over again, how should I? How should I try to change the outcomes? If I bring in more health experts to the table, I contend, no. We need to, to help other businesses, larger businesses, the real business community, understand the importance of them showing up when these important policy debates are going on. Because we know the number one cost for most Fortune 500 companies is salary, the number two cost is health care, and the biggest, the, 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 most, the most evidence-based way to lower that health care cost 
is to prevent people from smoking or to help people quit smoking. Good health means good business. We know communities shape health and health is essential to prosperity and it's a virtuous cycle. It can be a virtuous cycle. In far too many communities, the cycle goes the other way. We don't invest in health, business suffers, business suffers, health suffers, and you have a downward spiral. But we've seen in communities like Fort Worth, Texas, like East Lake, Georgia, that we can create that virtuous upward cycle. Business and public health, the two sectors, the report you're gonna hear about today focuses on need to be interested in both, because you can't have one without the other. You cannot have one without the other. And you heard my guiding principle is better health through better partnerships, because none of us can do it alone. And when the solutions are complex, when they're innovative, when they're new, and especially when they're controversial, we can't afford to keep operating in silos. So my Community Health and Economic Prosperity, or CHEP initiative as I like to call it, is the concept that community health and economic prosperity are inextricably linked. Again, you can't have one without the other. And I want to quickly recognize Dr. Ursula Bauer, who we stole from CDC. Um, she was the head of the uh, CDC Chronic Disease Center. And I, I, I said, I absolutely have to have her to come work on this report. And uh, I want you all to, to know who she is because she's going to be a conduit with our office to help us lift up this check report. She knows, as many of you all know, that our health outcomes are in large part determined by our circumstances. Put another way, your zip code is more important than your genetic code in determining your ultimate health outcomes. Environmental, social, economic, physical factors shape the opportunities we have and the behaviors that we adopt. I 100% believe in personal responsibility, but I also 100% believe that the choices you make are completely dependent on the choices that lay in front of you. I'm a doctor, I live in a nice neighborhood. I just tell my kids to go out and play. I can walk a half a mile down the street to the grocery store and get fresh fruits and vegetables. I have the opportunity to make that healthy choice. But just outside the door right here, there are far too many folks who don't have that opportunity. How far do they have to go to get to the nearest grocery store? Can they send their kids out to play and, and, and exercise without fear of them getting hit by a car or accosted by someone who has nefarious intentions? Right now, so much is at risk because many of our communities and their residents aren't as healthy as they could be. We aren't putting them in a position to make healthy choices. And it's more than just our future prosperity that's at risk. It also impacts our national security. I've been working with the Surgeon General of the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force because, <coughs> shocking statistic, right now seven out of 10 of our 18 to 24 year olds in this country are ineligible for military service because they can't pass the physical, can't meet the educational requirements, or have a criminal background record. Put another way, our nation's poor health isn't just a matter of chronic disease, the things that Dr. Bauer cares about 20, 30 years down the road. We are literally a less safe country right now because we're an unhealthy country. The bottom line, we can, we must do better. When we make the case for community health as a pathway to economic prosperity, we then foster the investment in our communities that not only improves population health, but raises and sustains our collective financial success and our national and local security. So I want to highlight three things that I want you to remember and that you should take from the comments that people are making today. Number one, U.S. healthcare is expensive. We spend 3.4 trillion with a T dollars on healthcare each year. Almost one in five dollars our economy generates now goes to pay for healthcare. And the private sector pays for a good chunk of that. It's hurting our economic competitiveness across the world. I was talking to a gentleman who's one of the GM execs he actually challenged me when I said the number two cost for Fortune 500 companies is healthcare. He said, no, for us, our number one cost is healthcare. You're paying more for healthcare than you're paying for any other component when you buy a General Motors car. And yet we wonder why our American companies are struggling to be competitive with other entities across the planet. And these dollars aren't just diverted away from company profits, but from critical funding priorities like job creation, wage increases, and research and development. We fight about a mandatory minimum wage, but well, one of the biggest challenges for companies in terms of doing the right thing is that instead of being able to take their profits and divert them to wage increases, they're taking them and diverting them to pay for higher and higher healthcare costs. So if you want a higher wage in your communities, you need to address healthcare costs. Healthcare expenses also drain what we call the common resource pool, limiting funds available for infrastructure, education, public safety, 
and other national and local priorities. So even if you don't care one iota about health, if your top priority is crumbling bridges, if your top priority is, is a free college for everyone, then you need to make sure you're investing in health care because that money that would go to pay for those other things is being sucked away from those other priorities because of health care costs. In short, we all pay for lower health status one way or the other, and we all pay for higher health care costs. And it's not just health care costs that are a drag on our economy. It also affects, as Brian pointed out, our productivity. Workers with chronic pain account for 11 to $13 billion in lost productivity annually. Full-time workers in the U.S. who are overweight or obese or have other chronic health problems miss 450 million more days of work than healthy workers. This amounts to more than $150 billion a year in lost productivity. How many people's college tuition could we pay for with that? How many bridges could we pay for with that? And that's not the end of it. Our poor health leads to a total annual productivity loss of $226 billion, a drag on our businesses and our economy. The second thing I want you to remember is we're not getting what we pay for. <clears throat> measure after, we're spending all this money, what's our ROI? On measure after measure, life expectancy, infant mortality, maternal mortality, obesity, we fall far short of other nations despite spending so much money. So how can it be that we spend so much and get so little in return? Well, again, as Brian pointed out, health care is a very small part of overall health. So a lot of the focus, even in the debates you heard last night, were on health care, health care, health care. And I stand before you as a nation's doctor not to say that health care and access to high quality affordable health care is not important, but to help you all understand that if we focus 90% of our time, our talent, and our treasure on 10% of the problem, we're not going to move the needle. 80 to 85% of health is driven by factors that have little to do with health care, factors that largely exist in our communities. We know that most health occurs outside the four walls of a clinic or a hospital. Things like good paying jobs and the skills to get and to keep and succeed in those jobs, what the Department of Labor calls mainly sustaining careers, quality housing, transportation, access to places to be physically active and healthy, affordable foods, tobacco-free communities, and strong and supportive social networks. These community features shape health behaviors and influence our nation's health far more than access to health care. The report that's being released today, Good Health with Good Business, understands these fundamental relationships. And here's how the dots connect. Start with those family sustaining careers. Add in a dose of housing and education, quality child care, access to safe places for kids to play and be physically active, and to nutritious foods that people know how to cook and prepare. And what you get is healthy people. And when you have those healthy people who are physically, socially, and economically healthy, they in turn become healthy, productive, present employees. They become consumers who have more money to spend and less likely to need expensive downstream social supports, less likely to become incarcerated, like my brother right now, who instead of contributing to the economy, is costing each one of you all as taxpayers about $100,000 a year to keep him incarcerated due to his unrecognized, untreated mental health issues, which led to substance abuse and addiction. Multiply that positive effect across communities, businesses, and employers, and what you end up with is a robust economy. Multiply what's going on in far too many communities, what's going on to my brother across the United States, and what you see is a drag on our economy. It all starts with investments in community health. Now, some people think it's the government's job to invest in our communities, but in a democratic market economy like ours, it's everyone's responsibility. Everyone is a stakeholder. So I want to close with a call to action to you all. As leaders in public health and in business, you have unique opportunities to leverage your influence and resources to forge stronger partnerships that promote the health and economic prosperity of your communities. Do this by identifying and addressing the barriers to good health in your communities. Business and civic leaders, faith organizations, justice and law enforcement, philanthropies, finance, you all have a role. And let me say to my public health friends in the room, we often think people should come to our table and learn our languages and help us solve our problems. But that's not the way it works. We have to build better partnerships by going to non-health partners, identifying, listening, and often doing things their way. 
We get more done when we build that trust, solve the problems that matter to others, and in the process, we see that they'll be more willing to engage and help us solve our problems. I call them here to help strengthen worksite wellness programs, addressing factors like tobacco, healthy food, and physical activity, financial literacy and capability, and beyond. But as Brian mentioned, we must go beyond worksite wellness to improve community health. For business leaders, remember 80% plus of health is beyond healthcare. Lean into those factors that challenge health. Support efforts to improve housing, education, access to foods, transportation, and healthy child development. Many businesses and employers fail to realize the value that accrues to them from investing in communities. And again, I'm not talking just about philanthropy. I love talking to your foundation president. I need to talk to your COO and your CEO. We need it to be not just part of your, your philanthropic plan, but part of your overall business strategic plan. True investment means incorporating it into everything that you do so that when the economy goes down, your contributions to community health don't go down. That's when you double down on them because you know you're gonna have more resilience if you do that. And that's why the report today is so important. Businesses and public health must work together to solve our nation's most pressing health problems, which are business problems too. Avon said, Naranan said that uh, his key word for you today was catalyze. My key word for you today is partnerships. I invite you to join me to help create a future where communities are built so people can more easily make healthy choices and where businesses invest in those communities as a way of achieving a healthier workforce and a healthier bottom line. Thank you very much.